ahead. Good morning, brothers and sisters. May you have a wonderful Sabbath. Welcome back to our study. Again, we're going to be going back into the document that was sent out a couple of weeks ago on Ezekiel 20. So as we begin our study again, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction and to impart to us the wisdom that we need to understand that which we are about to read. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you. As we are joined together, we thank you that you have stated that where two or more are gathered, there you will be also. We welcome you into this study. We seek your guidance. We seek your direction. We ask for your wisdom so that our minds might be opened to understand that which we need to understand for this time in Earth's history. Help us now, Father. Guide us. Forgive us of our sins. Direct us so that we may become the people that you would need to give your message to this world. We thank you, Father, for many answers to prayer. We thank you for the opportunity to bring before you our needs in prayer. We ask now for the guidance of your spirit and the presence of your angels so that our minds may be clear and we may be able to participate and grow. Direct us now. We thank you. We plead. We praise you. And we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we're going back through this, we're going to look at a very brief recap. Now, there's going to be several things that we're going to be addressing today, much of which is going to be part of what we have done in the past in other studies. When we've gotten to this part in Ezekiel chapter 20, there was a document that had been written by Mrs. White early on after the Great Disappointment. This document was called Word to the Little Flock. So for those taking notes, you would be looking for WLF, roughly chapter, or excuse me, page 18. And we're going to be going over the portions of scripture that she linked in this document. And I saw that if God had changed the Sabbath from the seventh to the first day, he would have changed the writing of the Sabbath commandment written on the tables of stone which are now in the ark in the most holy place of the temple in heaven. Revelation eleven nineteen, And it would read thus, the first day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. But I saw that it read the same as when written on the tables of stone by the finger of God and delivered to Moses in Sinai. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Exodus 20.10. Now, it's kind of interesting that the last of the verses that we were reading last Sabbath was Ezekiel 20.10. Wherefore, I caused them to go forth out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. He brings the children of Israel into the wilderness to understand 
the importance of the Sabbath. Last night's study, we were addressing that there are many that could truly be called nominal Adventists because they do not truly understand the Sabbath and its importance for us. I saw that the Holy Sabbath is and will be the separating wall between the true Israel of God and unbelievers, and that the Sabbath is the great question to unite the hearts of God's dear waiting saints. And if one believed and kept the Sabbath and received the blessing attending it, and then gave it up and broke the Holy Commandment, they would shut the gates of the Holy City against themselves as sure as there was a God that rules in heaven above. What does this tell us right now? Is not... Uh, <clears throat> sorry, Dwight. It tells us that breaking Sabbath will result in our damnation. We're going to be barred from heaven. Does this not also tell us that we have a choice to make? Here, as she states, if one believed and kept the Sabbath and received the blessing and then gave it up. One, two, three, four steps they would shut the gates of the holy city against themselves is it is she saying here that god would shut the gates of the holy city against them no they would shut it against themselves how clear is that uh, pretty clear i saw that god had children who do not see and keep the sabbath they had not rejected the light upon it and at the commencement of the time of trouble, we were filled with the Holy Ghost and went forth and proclaimed the Sabbath more fully. Hosea 6, 2 and 3. After two days, he will revive us. In the third day, he will rise us up and we shall live in his sight. Then we shall know if we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and the former rain unto the earth. This enraged the church and nominal Adventists, as they could not refute the Sabbath truth. And at this time, God's chosen all saw clearly that we had the truth. And they came out and endured the persecution with us. And I saw the sword, <clears throat> famine, pestilence, and great confusion in the land. Now here she gives reference to Ezekiel 7, verses 10 to 19. And 2 Esdras <clears throat> chapter 15, verses 5 through 27. Now what's important about Ezekiel 7? Which vision is Ezekiel 7? Well, it's still the first vision. Okay. So if this is still the first vision, this is something for us to pay attention with. And it's the first vision about what? Well, it's the living creatures that it starts with. Okay, now this, this portion of Ezekiel, Mrs. White, is referencing verse 10 through verse 19. So if we go back to this, and we covered this almost three years ago. Ezekiel 7, verse 10. Behold the day, behold, it is come. Is this a doubling?
Most certainly, yes. Okay. The morning has gone forth. The rod has blossomed. Pride has budded. How can the rod blossom and pride bud? Is this a good thing? It doesn't sound like it. Okay. Now, violence has risen up into a rod of wickedness. None of them shall remain, nor of their multitude, nor of any of theirs. Neither shall be wailing for them. Now, the alternate reading would be thus. Violence is risen up into a rod of wickedness. None of them shall remain, nor any of their tumult, nor of any of their tumultuous persons. Neither shall be there neither shall there be wailing for them. The time is come, the day draweth near. Let not the buyer rejoice, nor the seller mourn, for wrath is upon the multitude thereof. There are many at this time that are choosing to set aside God's law. For the seller shall not return to that which is sold, although they were yet alive. For the vision is touching the whole multitude thereof, which shall not return. Neither shall any strengthen himself in the iniquity of his life. So in this situation, as we are as we are considering this in Ezekiel 7:13 so we are looking here that this is another of the calzone vision the big picture the worldwide vision is that clear? Can we see that this is not something that is personal, that this is not just directed at one group, that this is something for the entire world? Yeah, let's... They have blown the trumpet, even to make all ready, but none goeth to the battle, for my wrath is upon all the multitude thereof. We know that the trumpets are blown to signal a solemn convocation, such as the Day of Atonement, such as the Jubilee year. We know that the, the trumpets are blown as a warning that we must go to battle. Yet here, they have blown the trumpet even to make all ready, but none goeth to battle. Why would we think that? Why, why is this being presented in this way? Here we have the situation. Buyers and sellers are leaving their goods. The trumpet has been being blown. 
and no one is assembling. Because they have begun to understand that God is making it clear that we have offended him, that we have not worshipped him in spirit and in truth, and we have made void the Sabbath. The sword is without, and the pestilence and the famine within. <clears throat> he that is in the field shall die with the sword, and he that is in the city, famine and pestilence shall devour him. What kind of a warning is this for us? I mean, this is just the first of, what is it, five visions that Ezekiel had? Or is it four? Of how many visions Ezekiel has? Yes. It's 13. 13 visions. But they that escape of them shall escape, and shall be on the mountains like doves of the valleys, all of them mourning, every one for his iniquity. All hands shall be feeble, and all knees shall be weak as water. Now, it's interesting when I'm looking at this, as I was looking to prepare for this last night, all knees shall be weak as water. What are we talking about here as far as weak as water? <clears throat> what do we see in this verse? Is there something that this word is telling us? Oh, it reminds me of Belshazzar in Daniel 5. When he got the sentence pronounced against him, he felt really weak. It says his knees were knocking together. Okay. What about Reuben? Did not Jacob declare that his firstborn was as unstable as water? I also find it interesting that this same phrase comes up again in Ezekiel 21, verse 7. And that reads, And it shall be when they say unto thee, Wherefore sighest thou, that thou shalt answer for the tidings, because it cometh, and every part shall melt, and all hands shall be feeble, and every spirit shall faint. And all knees shall be weak as water, behold it cometh, and shall be brought to pass, saith the Lord of God, the Lord God. The other question, though, when we're looking at this, when all knees shall be weak as water or all knees shall go into water. The Hebrew can have a, how shall we say this? A euphemism. So, is this a situation where they are so scared, where they are so afraid of what is going to go on, that they empty their bladder upon themselves? Mm hmm It's kind of a fearsome time. They shall also gird themselves with sackcloth 
and horror shall cover them. And shame shall be upon all faces and baldness upon all their heads. They shall cast their silver in the streets and their gold shall be for uncleanness. Their silver and their gold shall not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. They shall not satisfy their souls, neither fill their bowels. Their iniquity is their stumbling block. Is this not describing a people that have chosen to hold on to their sins rather than being clothed in Christ's righteousness? What does this say to us today? For is not this vision written more for our time than the time in which it was written? Now, second, <clears throat> second Esdras, behold, saith the Lord, I will bring plagues upon the world, the sword, famine, death, and destruction. For wickedness hath exceedingly polluted the whole earth, and their hurtful works are fulfilled. Therefore, saith the Lord. Is this not being very clear? Is this not being very direct? Do we not see today that wickedness is polluting the whole earth and that man is doing much to hurt other men? Absolutely. I will hold my tongue no, long, no more as touching their wickedness which they profanely commit. Neither will I suffer them in those things in which they wickedly exercise themselves. Behold, the innocent and righteous blood crieth unto me, and the souls of the just complain continually. And therefore saith the Lord, I will surely avenge them, and receive unto me all the innocent blood among them. Behold, my people is led as a flock to the slaughter. I will not suffer them now to dwell in the land of Egypt. What is being given reference here regarding the land of Egypt? Is this not the Lord saying that he will not allow his people to continue to dwell in this world? I find it very interesting that this document, written in 1847, gave reference multiple times to portions of the Apocrypha. Yet we have many that tell us that we should not make use of the Apocrypha for any reason. But what does Sister White say to us about this? Does she not say in vision that the wise will understand with what we are, are reading currently from the Apocrypha? That's my understanding. But I will bring them with a mighty hand and a stretched out arm and smite Egypt with plagues as before and will destroy the land thereof. <clears throat> Have we not understood that there will again be plagues brought upon the earth? Uh, that's, yeah, that, <laughs> some of the end time scenario? Yes. 
Egypt shall mourn, and the foundation of it shall be smitten with the plague and punishment that God shall bring upon it. They that till the ground shall mourn, for their seed shall fall through the blasting and hail, and with a fearful constellation. Woe to the world and them that dwell therein. For there shall be sedition among men, and invading one another. They shall not regard their kings nor their princes, and the course of their actions shall stand in their power. A man shall desire to go into a city and shall not be able. Are we not seeing this occurring right now with Russia and the Ukraine? Are we not seeing that there will be sedition among men and they're invading one another? <clears throat> so when does that stop? I mean, it's been happening forever. Right. Written in 1847. What was the, the premise that Elder Jeff had chosen when he gave the uh, presentations in Oklahoma in 2010? What began October 22nd, 1844? Does anyone remember? <clears throat> what are you asking exactly? Yeah, so I'm with, trying to figure out your question. Okay, yeah. October 22nd, 1844. Elder Jeff, <clears throat> in his presentations in Oklahoma, he made a very pointed comment that something specific began October 22nd, 1844. And he related it then to a specific event beginning September 11th, 2001. Yeah, so he, he dealt with the seventh trumpet. It sounded. In, in order to answer the brother's question, Elder Jeff presented that on October 22nd, 1844, the judgment of the dead began. And on September 11th, 2001, the judgment of the living began. Yeah. Was that in one of his later presentations? No, it's one of the first. One of the first. <clears throat> he deals with that later on. Yes, he does. In those, Because um, that's where somebody noticed that there was a counterfeit um, line there as well with the papacy right i don't remember the details but <clears throat> so if we are currently within the judgment of the living are we not living at a time very close to when christ is going to stand up and leave the sanctuary uh, yes If that is the case, are we not today to be seeking him so that our hearts, our minds, and our characters may be prepared for that event? Yeah, that's that's what he's trying to do is he's trying to. He's trying to give us advance warning so we'd be prepared for all this stuff. Because we don't want to have this occur as a thief in the night. We wish to be prepared like the five wise virgins because we do not know the day or the hour when our Lord is going to return. Right? Well, I would say that that's been the whole point of the July 18th experience. Yet we are coming to a point where, again, there will need to be a midnight cry. Why? 
what is the what were the premises of Ezekiel 8 and Ezekiel 9? Does Ezekiel 8 not address the abominations that have gone on within the temple of Ezekiel's time? Yeah, to the best of my knowledge. And then Ezekiel 9, what happens? In this subsequent chapter, is this vision not showing us that judgment begins first where? Is it not at the house the of God? House of God. Yep. <clears throat> um, and these are not written only for, for Ezekiel's time, but for all time, especially for our time. Yes, it is for our time. So here we have the advance warning. The advance warning is being given to the world and to the church. Yet there are few that are listening. There are few that are willing to accept this message of warning. Well, there were only eight that got onto the ark. Right. And there were only 50 that came through the Great Disappointment. That's the numbers I remember. A man shall desire to go into a city and shall not be able. For because of their pride, the city shall be troubled. The houses shall be destroyed and men shall be afraid. I was asked to view a presentation that Walter Weith had given a while back. It was very interesting because his presentation used many quotes from items that we have all been studying over these last many years. He especially was giving reference to the Nashville visions, but he did not wish to identify it as the Nashville vision. Yet here, for because of their pride, the city shall be troubled, the houses shall be destroyed, and men shall be afraid. When the destruction comes upon Nashville, are there not many that will be afraid? Are there not many that will say, we knew that this was going to happen, <clears throat> and their neighbors will turn to them saying, you knew, you did not warn us? We were your neighbor. Have we not read this before? A man shall have no pity upon his neighbor, but shall destroy their houses with the sword and spoil their goods because of the lack of bread and for great tribulation. Behold, saith God, I will call together all the kings of the earth to reverence me, which are from the rising of the sun, from the south, from the east, and Labanius, to turn themselves one against another, and repay the things that they have done to them, like as they do yet this day unto my chosen so will I do also, and recompense in their bosom. Thus saith the Lord God. My right hand shall not spare the sinners, and my sword shall not cease over them that shed innocent blood upon the earth. The fire is gone forth from his wrath, and hath consumed the foundations of the earth, and the sinners like the straw that is kindled. Woe to them that sin! And keep not my commandments, saith the Lord. I will not spare them. Go your way, ye children, from the power. Defile not my sanctuary. 
for the Lord knoweth all them that sin against him, and therefore delivereth he them unto the death and destruction. For now are the plagues come upon the whole earth, and ye shall remain in them, for God shall not deliver you, because ye have sinned against him. The wicked thought that we had brought the judgments down upon them. They rose up and took counsel to rid the earth of us, thinking that then the evil would be stayed. Second Esdras 16, 68-74, found in Word to the Little Flock, page 18, paragraph 4. For behold, the burning wrath of a great multitude is kindled over you. And they shall take away certain of you and feed you, being idle, with things offered unto idols. Are we not seeing today within the church many times that things offered unto idols Things not of God are being presented as if they were of God. And they that consent unto them shall be had in derision and in reproach and trodden underfoot. For there shall be in every place and in the next cities a great insurrection upon those that fear the Lord. They shall be like madmen, sparing none, but still spoiling and destroying those that fear the Lord. For they shall waste and take away their goods and cast them out of their houses. Then shall they be known, who are my chosen, and they shall be tried as the gold in the fire. Hear, O ye, my beloved, saith the Lord. Behold, the days of trouble are at hand, but I will deliver you from the same. Can we not hold on to this promise? Just as we would hold on knowing that warnings have been given and that warnings have been despised by many. Yet God promises that he will deliver us. The seventh day is God's chosen day. He has not left this matter to be remodeled by priest or ruler. It is of too great importance to be left to human judgment. God saw that men would study their own convenience and choose a day best suited to their inclinations, a day bearing no divine authority. And he has stated plainly that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. This was written 50 years after Word to the Little Flock. I have a question. Certainly. So, wasn't it Christ that was the creator? Yes. Um, but he himself rested on the Sabbath. Now, he's like, he is um, a, a mirror image of God, right? Isn't, isn't he, that what we basically understand his character is of God. I would say so, yes. So he was actually, for sake of argument, he was actually um, not resting under his own desire, but that was God's desire from the very beginning. Right. So he was just doing what he was supposed to do. He didn't, he didn't like um, um, put that day there because he was the creator and he was the he was god because he wasn't he he was god manifested in um in the form of christ right i mean in his his character was manifested in christ 
right so 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 he was just doing what he was supposed to do so when people say that you know the sabbath uh, was invented by him, and then it was changed by him too. So how do they? How does that work? I mean, he never changed it in the first place. He followed it, right? That's my question. How? How can people make that assumption or make that claim? Well, tradition. Oh, because my father had worshipped on Sunday, therefore I will worship on Sunday. I even had a man that had been a friend for many years make a comment to me that, well, these people have to work through the weekend so their Sabbath can be Monday, their Sabbath can be Tuesday. They can choose when their Sabbath is going to be. So did Christ choose? Christ honored the sabbath because hey there we go there's the logic of it okay (laughs) i'm sorry to distract you bro no 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 you're fine you're fine now there was a question from the chat so i'm going to return to this very quickly so when we when we were looking at this behold saith god i will call together all the kings of the earth to reverence me which are from the rising of the sun, from the south, from the east, and Labanus, to turn themselves one against another and repay the things that they have done to them. Now, here we are dealing with a Latin word. But the Semitic root word for this would mean white. It can also refer to frankincense. What's important about the frankincense? Why are well? It was you. It was used in, in in the the temple, but it was also a gift to Christ. But I know too. It's uh, when it talks about Lebanus, it's it could be from from the north because you hear in the east, the south, and but you don't hear about the the north or the west really from the rising of the sun, from the south, from the oh east and Lebanus. So I think it could be from the north symbolically. Okay, but they're turning themselves one against another. Are we not seeing and have we not studied that the situation that we are going to find, especially with this of the children of Islam, that they turn against every man and every man against them? Uh, Yeah, that's the way I read it. But we're not just going to find it in Islam. It's become that spirit is coming on all people. Yes, it is. We need, we need to resist it. I mean, I can feel the tension constantly. I agree. Ezekiel 20, verse 11. And I gave them my statutes, and I showed them my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. What's being, refer- what's being referenced here? Commands. Here again, Deuteronomy 4, verse 8. And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I have set before you this day? What other nation holds so completely? To the law of Jehovah. And acts as righteously. As this law would have us to act. None. Yeah, I don't see any. Yet. I've been looking for a while. We've all been looking for it.
God, Jehovah, has given them my statutes and showed them my judgments. Leviticus 18.5 Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. Seven chapters later, we have the admonitions to allow the land to rest. Eight chapters later, in Leviticus 26, what do we have? What would we commonly call that chapter? Uh, the blessings and curses? Exactly. If we keep the statutes, are we not to be blessed? Yes. <clears throat> If we reject the statutes, are we not to be cursed? Yes. Galatians 3.12 And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Romans 10.5 For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Are we empowered to set aside the law in any manner? Negative. Is the law a burden? Well, it depends on who you ask, but no. Was it a burden to Christ? No. Did he not offer, come to me, ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest? Those did are his not, words. Did he not state to take upon us his burden because his burden is what? Like. Yet, how many of us choose to accept the burden of Christ? Because when we accept that burden of Christ, are we then not equally yoked with him? Yes. But there was still a greater truth to be impressed upon their minds. Living in the midst of idolatry and corruption, they had knew no true conception of the holiness of God, of the exceeding sinfulness of their own hearts. Their utter inability in themselves to render obedience to God's law and their need of a savior. All of this must be taught. Review and Herald, 17 October, 1907. <clears throat> now, in light of what we were studying last night, does this reference to that of the children of Israel not apply to us today as well? Do we not need the greater truth of the right understanding of righteousness by faith to be impressed upon our minds. Are we not today living in the midst of idolatry and corruption? I'm sorry, that question again? Are we not today living in the midst of idolatry and corruption? Oh, yeah. Do we have a true conception of the holiness of God? No. 
have we accepted how sinful our own hearts are? Have we come face to face with this? Some, not all. Again, have we accepted our complete inability to render obedience to God's law? Are we worshiping him in spirit and in truth? God brought them to Sinai. He manifested his glory. He gave them his law with the promise of great blessings on condition of obedience. If you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. Exodus 19, 5 and 6. Does this say that just the Levites were going to become priests? No. Who was going to become priests? Those that uh, were obedient. That if they kept the covenant, the nation of Israel would become unto God a kingdom of priests and would be an holy nation. What a promise is this? The people did not realize the sinfulness of their own hearts. And that without Christ, it was impossible for them to keep God's law. And they readily entered into the covenant with God. Feeling that they were able to establish their own righteousness. They declared, all that the Lord hath said we will do and, and be obedient. Exodus 24, 7. How many times do we make the comment that this is something that we do 24, 7? As if we are doing this all of the time, every day. They had witnessed the proclamation of the law in awful majesty and had trembled with terror before the mount. Yet only a few weeks passed before they broke their covenant with God and bowed down to worship a graven image. Just a few weeks later. They could not hope for the favor of God through a covenant which they had broken. And now seeing their sinfulness and their need of pardon, they were brought to feel their need of the Savior revealed in the Abrahamic covenant and shadowed forth in the sacrificial offerings. Now by faith and love, they were bound to God as their deliverer from the bondage of sin. Now they were prepared to appreciate the blessings of the new covenant. The terms of the old covenant were obey and live. If a man do, he shall even live in them. Ezekiel 20, verse 11, Leviticus 18, 5. But cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. Deuteronomy 27, 6. The new covenant was established upon better promises, the promise of forgiveness of sins and of the grace of God to renew the heart and bring it into harmony with the principles of God's law. This shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write in their hearts. I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Jeremiah 31, 33, and 34. 
The same law that was engraved upon the tables of stone is written by the Holy Spirit upon the tables of the heart. What does this mean to us? Can we take solace? Can we accept this promise just as it reads? That there will be those upon whose heart is written the law and the covenant with God. So it's written, so it shall be, right? Correct. Instead of going about to establish our own righteousness, we accept the righteousness of Christ. <clears throat> His blood atones for our sins. His obedience is accepted for us. Then the heart renewed by the Holy Spirit will bring forth the fruits of the Spirit. Through the grace of Christ, we shall live in obedience to the law of God written upon our hearts. Having the Spirit of Christ, we shall walk even as he walked. Through the prophet, he declared of himself, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Psalm 40, verse 8. And when among men he said, The Father hath not let, left me alone. For I do always those things that please him. Here we have a situation. Here we have an example. Here we are, but in, in the chat, we're receiving a question. So how do we answer this? When the Lord shall put his law in our inward parts of the heart, shall we totally abandon sin? What say you? How do we approach that? Well, I would say yes, but right now, and I know in my present state, it's a real work in progress. Yes, it is a work in progress for all so, of us. So the answer actually is is in the question. Right. <laughs> Shall we not abandon sin? It was more, more, more of a statement, not a question. <laughs> okay. Now, when we read this from John 8, 29, does this not give an answer to many that believe that God created the world and has left it to its own devices? Well, that, Christ, that, that statement you made is not a true statement. I mean, he didn't leave it to its own devices. Right. But do we not have those that are making that kind of a, a claim? Well, sure. Nothing new under the sun, brother. And just as, as being said here, the Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. If we are in a covenant relationship, if we are in a relationship that really means something eternally. Do we not seek to honor the one with whom we are in that relationship with? Here's Christ. He knew that he was not left alone by the Father. He always did those things that pleased the Father. He lived according to the law and the covenant. 
Is this not what we are called upon to do today? Now the question is asked, how shall we know that God has put his law in our hearts? Well, the first John, if you read that book, um, he says it's by faith. Right. Not by sight. And, and we have determined that faith is obedience. Right. Faith is obedience. So he that says, I know God, but keeps not his commandments is a liar. Right. So correct. Um, you know, it's an impossible for somebody who, who knows God uh, to sin. So, you know, people have this struggle, but what, what John says is that, we have this witness, and that witness, if we are obedient to God, we can have this witness by faith. So it's not something that we we look for in ourselves. Righteousness we look for in Christ. It will be produced in us, but we don't look at ourselves to see whether it's produced or not. We assume that when we look at ourselves, we will see ourselves as sinners. Uh, yes. This is my thought. We'll never see ourselves as righteous. Uh, well, that's the that's the real deception right there. I believe that it's once you start seeing yourself as righteous, then you've really jumped off the cliff. Yes. The Apostle Paul clearly presents the relation between faith and the law under the new covenant. He says, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, it could not justify man, because in his sinful nature, he could not keep the law. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in who? That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit, Romans 5, 1, 3, 31, and Romans 8, 3, and 4. Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. How important is it for us to be sanctified? Very. It is. Now, there's an adage that we've addressed many times in study. Justification is the work of a moment. Coming to the cross understanding at the foot of the cross our great need of Christ yet what is justification the work of a moment what then becomes sanctification work of a lifetime there are many today whose lifetimes may have to be compressed into a very short amount of time in order to become sanctified
Because if oh, we, that's why he calls us little ones, right? Exactly. Manuscript 39, 1899. After going through this, after reading this, I would suggest that this entire article be read. This was one of the non-published articles. Have we wholly given ourselves up to do God's will? Have we surrendered all? Are we willing to leave everything at the foot of Christ? Are we transformed by the grace of Christ? Some claim to be in Christ, while their special work is to make void the law of Jehovah. Shall we take their word for it? Shall we accept their assertions? How shall we distinguish God's true servants from the false prophets which Christ said should arise to deceive many? There is only one test of character, the law of Jehovah. So what is the test of character here? The law of Jehovah. So if this is the case, we have the standard yet before us. There's no guesswork. There's no assumptions. This is the law of Jehovah. That is our measuring stick. The Israelites placed over their doors a signature of blood to show that they were God's property. Think of that for a moment. They were willing in the midst of idolatry to show that they were God's property. So every child of God in this age will bear the signature God has appointed. They will place themselves in harmony with God's holy law. A mark is placed upon every one of God's people, just as verily as a mark was placed over the doors of the Hebrew dwellings to preserve the people from the general ruin. God declares, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify them. Ezekiel 20.12 When men say that the law of God is abrogated by the testimonies of the fathers, they are teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. Their word is not founded upon the teaching of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ is not the chief cornerstone of their structure. John says, he that saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. First John 2, 4. Those who permit themselves to be deceived will with the deceiver feel the wrath of the lamb. Is this not direct enough for us at this time? Does this not say to us right now that if, like the foolish Galatians, we allow others to beguile us, that we allow others to deceive us with something that is not of the law, that we will then feel the wrath of Christ and also feel the wrath of God, of Jehovah himself. With God's word before us, with the lesson of instruction we may there learn, 
there is no need for us to be deceived. We are living in a momentous period in the Earth's history. The great conflict is just before us. We see the world corrupted under the inhabitants thereof. The man of sin has worked with a marvelous perseverance to exalt a spurious Sabbath. And the disloyal Protestant world has wandered after the beast and has called obedience to the Sabbath instituted by Jehovah disloyalty to the laws of the nations. Kingdoms have confederated to sustain a false Sabbath institution, which has not a word of authority in the oracles of God. But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They walked not in my statutes, and they despised my judgments. Which if a man do, he shall even live in them. And my Sabbaths they greatly polluted. Then I said I would pour out my fury upon them in the wilderness to consume them. But I wrought for my name's sake that it should not be polluted before the heathen, in whose sight I brought them out. Yet also I lifted up my hand unto them in the wilderness, that I would not bring them into the land that I had given them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. At this time, has the house of Israel rebelled against God? Are we not in the wilderness just as much as the children of Israel were? Are we not seeing it today that there are many who give lip service to our need to obey the law of God and that we are seeing that they are despising the judgments of God, that they are choosing to set aside not only the law, but the gospel message, including the health message. We need to learn more. We need to understand more so that we may truly live within God's statutes, that we may follow and understand the judgments of Jehovah, so that we may live in them and honor the Sabbaths correctly. Because they despised my judgments and not and walked not in my statutes, but polluted my Sabbaths, for their heart went after their idols. <clears throat> Here we have a choice. Our hearts can go after idols, or Jehovah will write his law, his covenant upon our hearts. Which do we wish today? Nevertheless, mine eyes spared them from destroying them. Neither did I make an end of them in the wilderness. But I said unto their children in the wilderness, Walk ye not in the statutes of your fathers, neither observe their judgments, nor defile yourselves with their idols. I am the Lord your God, walk in my statutes, and keep my judgments and do them. And hollow my Sabbaths, 
and they shall be a sign between me and you that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. Is Jehovah not calling us to know him, to test him, so that we may trust in him? Is this not the purpose of the warnings of the time that we have been granted? Are we not to know our God? I'd like you to look at something here very quickly. When we're looking here, I am the Lord your God, walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. As this was being put together, the translators of the Bible gave reference to Deuteronomy 5, 32 and 33. Ye shall observe to do them before the Lord your God hath commanded you. Ye shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Ye shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you, and ye that ye may live, and that it may be well with you, and that ye may prolong your days in the land which ye shall possess. Now, the translators chose to suggest that we compare this portion from Deuteronomy with Deuteronomy 6, 7, 8, 10, 11, and 12. All of the chapters. So at this point, when we're looking at Ezekiel 20, verse 19, which I find interesting, because it was in 2019 that Elder Jeff again began his warnings to those that remained within the movement. Here we are being told, I am the Lord your God, walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. Observe these chapters, read them, see what you are able to glean from these chapters before we return this next Sabbath for our next meeting. We need to be very careful that we do not view in a wrong light matters connected with the work of God. We are to we need to guard against the least injustice. Those who bear the burden of the work of winning souls to Christ are to be encouraged and helped. The Lord requires that unity exist in every church, but the policy of consolidation must be guarded against. The workers in our institutions are to preserve their individuality each is to sense the responsibility resting upon him while he works under the divine leadership of the Lord Jesus. The workers are to counsel together and to seek to bring in ideas that are in harmony with the teachings of truth, but never, as long as time shall last, in an arbitrary man-ruling power to come in to take the place and the authority of God. <clears throat> this last week, as I was digging through some other I items, I ran across a thumb drive that had presentations on it that I had given back in 2020. 
one of those presentations was presented on December 5th, just before the pronouncement. It was interesting that from the book of Acts, I had been led to give a presentation addressing the need for unity within this movement. And as we are all aware, we know what took place the following day. I was also surprised that because within less than a day, this presentation had been removed from the FFA website. How many times does the Lord need to show us that we need to have unity? Unity of purpose, unity of spirit, unity among brothers and sisters. Does not the Lord require that unity exist in every church? Is that not what it says here right now? Yeah, it's a basic requirement. But why yeah. do you think Satan and his angels were cast out? There was no unity there. Right. There was no unity with God. So if this is a basic requirement for us, why are we finding it so difficult to have unity today? All the worldly ways we have. The Lord has been instructing us to move forward. Shall we go forward or shall we stand still? Shall we not seek to increase in faith that we may work and wait in assurance and confidence? The word of God is to be our guide under all circumstances. If the word of God is to be our guide under all circumstances, is this not to be our guide in how we relate to our brothers and sisters? Is this not to be our guide as to how we are to treat others? Well, it, it's supposed to be. Right. Now, with what we've just read, Mrs. White compares Another portion from Ezekiel 18. But we are coming close to our time for this session. Do we have thoughts or comments over many of the things that we have already covered? Do you have questions? What yeah, we... I got one. Please. <clears throat> so why do you suppose um, God allowed you to discover that thumb drive? You made the comment about they had taken that thing down. Right. On the day before or the day, days after. Right. That it happened. So why do you suppose God makes it? Because um, I, I kind of believe that God has, not kind of believe, I believe God has his hands underneath all the wheels, including yes. all the wheels that are underneath us. And so there's a reason, bro. I don't know what it is, but there's a reason. Maybe you should post that video. I don't have the video. I just, I have my study. Oh, do you have the study. Maybe you should post the study. Fine. I will make the study available. It's interesting to look at this because this was just a, it was a Sabbath school presentation, but it was a Sabbath school presentation taken using Acts of the Apostles 
but then looking up different portions that, that Sister White had written about this, reflecting on the need for unity. Hmm. Ever since you um, started the pre presentations that uh, included the unity issues, yes, and and I started studying uh, the unity. Um, she, she's really, really consistent in that. I mean, <laughs> you can't mistake this as just being an off statement or something. She's really, no. really consistent in this. And she spells out in great detail, you know, how you are basically to um, accumulate this unity. Right. Um, <laughs> but it's hard. It's hard for us as, as the children of men um, right. living in uh the the world that satan possesses um and then trying to apply these things uh like joseph did he determined um to he made a turn you know there was a turning point right from from childhood uh to being the petted child uh to being um potiphar's um number one Right. You know, there was a turning point in that. Um, and he, according to her, um, said that he was courageous, courageous and self-possessed. Right. Um, that was a very interesting statement, that self-possessed thing. Um, what did that mean? <laughs> Uh, and the only thing that I've come to determine is, is that, uh, he was in charge of himself. Right. And so he, he was courageous by doing everything that God told him to, or right. that, you know, that he knew to be correct in God's way, even though he's living amongst that stuff. But, uh, you, you, you have to understand he came from that lifestyle and then got plunged into this other lifestyle. Most of us have grown up in that other lifestyle. How do we detract from that? How do we pull ourselves out of that? Uh, and, and really the only thing that I can really see is, is there's a need for a hospital. Um, and that hospital is our church and that church is supposed to help mend us and that's the whole part of the unity thing um people come into the church and they're not well they're the exact people that we're supposed to be attracting right but we can't we, we're not supposed to be sitting there you know with a ruler like sister mary and wrapping them on their knuckles every time they say something or do something that's you know offensive to them right <laughs> uh the most shrewdest individual i've ever seen has bared long with those types of things and continually turn the other cheek. Now, you know who I'm talking about. Sure. Our example. Yes. Um, but it is so hard to remember that um, in times of duress. And that's what we have to be able to do is manage our, manage our synaptic system to be able to handle that duress, which True. is completely relying upon God. Um, and not thinking that he's out to destroy us because he's not, he's out to actually preserve us. Uh, and he's just, you know, giving us guidance. True. As he always has. I mean, he's, he's, he hasn't taken a hands off approach ever. No. He he's has. actually had his hand reached out. And, and I, one of the pictures that, that comes to my mind is, is, um, that one in the Sistine Chapel that that guy spent so long in his back painting, you know, um, where hand, God's hand is reached out and Adam's hand is reached out and they're trying to touch. Right. That That's the, the picture I keep seeing in my head. <laughs> but that's a worldly picture again. I mean, you know, but this is the things that we have. Right. Like I, I read another spot where, you know, this unity stuff is is basically um, designed with self control as being the major motivator. Right now, uh, just just as a point, 
if you check the chat, uh, Iran was able to find a copy of that presentation and has now posted the YouTube link for it. What I will do, I will be posting using WhatsApp my notes from that presentation. And if others need them emailed to them, let me know. I'll be happy to email them in either Word or PDF format. Yes, please send them to me in PDF, right? Shall be done. Okay, any other comments or thoughts at this time? Yeah, you can send me those PDFs too, if you don't mind. Shall be done. Okay. So, shall we close today's session with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for allowing us the time to assemble together, to study together, to look to learn more of you through your word and through that of your prophets. We pray together today for your blessing on this Sabbath, that we may learn more so that we may indeed worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you for this time together. We ask you, Father, to continue to direct us in all ways and in all things so that we may continue to grow to become the people that you would want us to be. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.